computers. We made them, we love them, and they'll probably rule us one day. But in the 87 years since we invented the first computer, we've had thousands of innovations that led us to where we are today. Sometimes those innovations were amazing, some were downright stupid, and some were what I can only describe as cursed. And without further ado, here are the stories behind the most cursed computer innovations, starting with... BrainFuck is the most famous esoteric programming language, or in other words, the most famous programming language made purely for amusement. The program itself has only 8 simple commands, and yet it's still technically Turing complete, meaning it's possible to create any function from just these 8 commands. This makes it the quickest programming language to learn. In fact, just by looking at the 7 rules I have on the screen, you can probably learn the language in just a couple of minutes. In practice, however, BrainFuck is one of the most difficult to understand languages, let alone use. With just one look at a tiny snippet of code from this language, it's easy to see where the name comes from. Despite this, hundreds of complex programs have been written in this language, such as tic-tac-toe, a universal Turing machine, and even a program that can translate BrainFuck to C. In 1993, ID Software developed Doom, an incredibly popular FPS title that would live on for the next 30 years. And in 1997, ID Software would release Doom's source code to the public for use in a conveniently packaged Linux version. Since then, hundreds of modified versions of Doom's code have been created and released. In fact, one of the creators of Doom, John Romero, continues to release new and quality maps for the game to this day. The first unofficial Doom port was running on the Super Nintendo, and while that might not sound too crazy, the original Doom package was way too demanding to run on the Super Nintendo, and a second party, Williams, had to completely rewrite the program in order to get it to work. From there began a technological arms race to port Doom to anything and everything imaginable. Today, you can play Doom on a camera, you can play Doom on a piano, you can play Doom on an ATM, you can play Doom on a printer. And of course, you can play Doom on a toaster. The 500 Mile Email is a true story of an average developer by the name of Trey Harris. It reads a little something like this. I was working in a job okay. running the campus email system some years ago when I got a call from the chairman of the statistics department. We're having a problem sending email out of the department. What's the problem? I asked. We can't send mail more than 500 miles. The chairman replied. I choked on my latte. Come again? We can't send mail farther than 500 miles from here. He repeated. A little bit more, actually. Call it 520, but no farther. Um, email doesn't really work like that, generally, I said, trying to keep the panic out of my voice. One doesn't display panic when speaking to a department chairman, even of a relatively impoverished department like statistics. What makes you think you can't send mail more than 500 miles? It's not what I think, the chairman replied testily. You see, when we first noticed this happening a few days Ago. You waited a few days, I interrupted, a tremor tingling in my voice. And you couldn't send email this whole time? We could send email, just not more than- 500 miles, yes, I finished for him. I got that, but why didn't you call earlier? Well, we hadn't collected enough data to be sure of what was going on until just now. Right, this is the chairman of statistics. Anyway, I asked one of the geostaticians to look into it. Geostatisticians? Yes, and she's produced a map showing the radius within which we can send an email to be slightly more than 500 miles. I see, I said, and put my head in my hands. When did this start? A few days ago, you said, but did anything change in your systems at that time? Well, the consultant came in and patched our server and rebooted it, but I called him and he said he didn't touch the mail system. Okay, let me take a look and I'll call you back. If it wasn't April Fool's Day, I tried to remember if someone owed me a practical joke. I logged into the department server and sent a few test mails. This was in the Research Triangle of North Carolina, and a test mail to my own account was delivered without a hitch. Ditto for the one sent to Richmond, Atlanta, Washington, another to Princeton, they all worked. But then I tried to send a mail to Memphis. It failed. Boston. Failed. Detroit. 
failed. I got out my address book and started trying to narrow this down. New York worked, but Providence failed. I was beginning to wonder if I had lost my sanity. I tried emailing a friend who lived in North Carolina, but whose ISP was in Seattle. Thankfully, it failed. If the problem had had to do with the geography of the human recipient and not his mail server, I think I would have broken down into tears. Having established that, okay. unbelievably, the problem reporting to me was true and repeatable, I took a look at the files. They looked fairly normal. In fact, they looked familiar. I compared it against the files in my home directory. It hadn't been altered. It was the same files I had written. And I was fairly certain I hadn't enabled the fail mail over 500 miles option. At a loss, I teleneted to the port, and the server happily responded with a Sun OS SynMail banner. Wait a minute, a SunMail OS SynMail banner? At the time, Sun was shipping SynMail 5 with its operating system, even though SynMail 8 was fairly mature. Being a good system administrator, I had standardized on SynMail 8. And also being a good system administrator, I had written a file that used a nice long self-documenting option and variable names available in SynMail 8 rather than the cryptic punctuation mark codes that had been used in SynMail 5. The pieces fell into place all at once and I again choked on the dregs of my now cold latte. When the consultant had patched the server, he had apparently upgraded the version of Sun OS and in so downgraded SynMail. The update helpfully left the file alone even though it was the wrong version. It just so happens that SynMail 5, at least the version that Sun shipped, which had some tweaks, could deal with the SynMail 8 files, as most of the rules at that point had remained unaltered. But the new long configuration options, those it saw as junk and skipped. And the SynMail binary had no defaults compiled in for these, so finding no suitable settings in the file, they were set to zero. One of the settings that was set to zero was the timeout connection to the remote server. Some experimentation established on this particular machine with its typical load, a zero timeout would abort a connected call in slightly over three milliseconds. An odd feature of our campus network at the time was that it was 100% switch. An outgoing packet wouldn't incur a router delay until hitting the POP and reaching the router on the far side. So time to connect a lightly loaded remote host on a nearby network would actually be largely governed by the speed of light and the distance destination rather than by incidental router delays. Feeling slightly giddy, I typed into my shell. You have three millilight seconds. You want miles times 558.84719. Five hundred miles or a little bit more. On the 4th of January 2012, the hardest puzzle on the internet was born, named Cicada 3301. The name of Cicada 3301 was given to a mysterious organization that has thrice posted a set of puzzles to recruit the fastest and intelligent codebreakers from all over the world. This puzzle was initially posted on sites like Reddit and 4chan and ran for nearly a month. The puzzle stated, Hello, we are looking for highly intelligent individuals. To find them, we have devised a test. There is a message hidden in this image. Find it and it will lead you on the road to us. We look forward to meeting the few that will make it all the way through. Good luck. 3301. The second puzzle was posted one year later on January 4th, 2013, followed by a third puzzle on January 4th, 2014. So each puzzle was posted exactly a year after each other. These puzzles are solved using techniques like encryption, decryption, steganography, and various code breaking techniques. Cicada 3301 is the most debatable topic among people who solve technology related puzzles. Joel Erickson and Marcus Wenner are among the few people who've managed to solve the cicada, but yet couldn't get the opportunity to know who was behind all of this. According to Marcus, the ones who solved the puzzle were asked questions about their support of information freedom, online privacy, and the rejection of censorship. Those who answered satisfactory at this stage were invited to a private meeting where they were instructed to devise and complete a project. Marcus couldn't complete his work on a method of general decryption and thus was removed from the website. According to Joel, he was directed to an address on the anonymous Tor network. The coordinates led to telephone poles in countries around the world including Spain, Russia, America, France, Japan, and Poland. Therefore, Ericsson had to rely on other people for help. However, when he finally reached all these polls, Cicada had put up a message stating that they were disappointed in Ericsson for using other people to gather information. And that was the end of his contact with Cicada. To this day, it's still unknown the exact objective of Cicada 3301.
It doesn't seem like much of a place to visit. Granted, I've never actually been there. But I think I can imagine it. The vastness of the ocean, overcast skies, a heavy humidity in the air, no land in sight, with the only distinguishable feature being a lonely buoy bobbing up and down in the water. It almost seems like a non-place, but it might surprise you to learn this site is far from anonymous. This spot is a hive of activity in the world of geographic information systems. As far as digital geospace data is concerned, it may be one of the most visited places on Earth. This is Knoll Island. Knoll Island is an imaginary island located at 00 in the South Atlantic Ocean. The exact origins of Knoll Island is a bit murky, but it did reach a wide audience no later than 2011 when it was drawn into Natural Earth, a public domain map dataset developed by volunteer cartographers and GIS analysts. In creating a one square meter plot land at 00 in the digital dataset, Knoll Island was intended to help analysts flag errors in a process known as geocoding. Unfortunately, due to human typos, messy data, or even glitches in the geocoder itself, the geocoding process didn't always run so smoothly. Misspelled street names, non-existent building numbers, and other quirks can create invalid addresses that can confuse a geocoder so that the output becomes 00. While this output indicates that the error occurred, since 00 is in fact a location on the Earth's surface according to the coordinate system, the feature will be mapped there, as nonsensical as this location may be. What we end up with is an island of misfit data. Knoll Island is a curious blend of real and imaginary geography, of mathematical certainty and pure fantasy. Or it's just the site of a weather observation buoy. However you see it, we have the GIS world to thank for putting Knoll Island on the map, in its own strange way. The hobby of building PCs has been rapidly growing year after year since the late 90s. The last decade especially has catapulted the one small group of hobbyists into the mainstream. With thousands of cases to choose from, you can make your PC in any fashion you want. But for some extreme enthusiasts, that wasn't enough. Coming up with creative ways to build a PC became commonplace. Among the notable builds being fish tank PCs, fully wooden PCs, sleeper PCs, tesseract PCs, and so many. More. But why stop there? Why not make a PC out of beans? Why not make a PC that can fly? Why not make a PC you can pee in? And that is the art of building cursed computers. Making the most unconventional and unpractical computer to ever exist. And why might you ask? While most would tell you personal satisfaction, I think we can all agree it's for the seven karma points. The Basilisk Collection might have been one of the most compelling fake pieces of media to ever exist. As a piece of alternate history science fiction, this piece not only provides a technically accurate explanation of its premises, it also does a good job of speculating what the impact in the world might have been in such an event. But my single favorite part of the piece is that it includes what superficially looks like a genuine example of what a hypothetical basilisk.txt would contain. To do this, the author wrote a brute force hash finder and ran it for over a year. That's some serious dedication. The Basilisk Collection, also known as the Basilisk File or Basilisk.txt, is a collection of over 125 million partial hash inversions. And while it's not infeasible to think that these hashes could be inverted, it's just not possible with our current technology. The collection was released in parts through BitTorrent beginning in June 2018, although it wasn't widely reported or discussed until early 2019. And once people started to take notice, they started to panic. The ability to invert hashes at this rate meant that most cryptocurrencies were no longer secure. Perhaps even more scary was the idea that someone was using a supercomputer a million times faster than any modern computer to invert these hashes. Once the news spread, people started to panic. At first, they started to sell their crypto, leading to the 2019 Bitcoin crash. Just how many hashes had been inverted, and what was the goal of the person behind all of this? Famous cryptographer Brian Landwall has said that whoever made the basilisk is 30 years ahead of the NSA, and the NSA are 30 years ahead of us, so who is left to trust? But as it turns out, such reality is too out of proportion to be real. Some unknown individual had created and ran a brute force hash finder for over a year in order to fake that they had a supercomputer. And it worked. For a little over a week, this person had fooled just about every single cryptographer in the world into thinking that the majority of the world's data was at jeopardy. And that's the real story behind the Basilisk Collection.
On September 9, 1947, a team of computer scientists and engineers reported the world's first computer bug. Today, software bugs can impact the functioning, safety, and security of computer operating systems. Debugging and bug management are important parts of the computer science industry. This bug, however, was literally a bug. Quote unquote, the first actual case of a bug being found. One of the team members wrote in a logbook. The team at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts found that their computer, the Mark II, was delivering inconsistent errors. And when they opened up the computer's hardware, they found a moth. The trapped insect had disrupted the electronics of the computer, and thus the name bug was coined. I Love You, sometimes referred as Love Bug or Love Letter for You, is a computer worm that infected over 10 million Windows personal computers on and after May 5th, 2000. It started spreading as an email message with the subject line I Love You and the attachment Love Letter for You.txt.vbs. At the time, Windows computers often hid the latter file extension VBS, a type of interpreted file, by default because it was an extension for a file type that Windows knows, leading unwitting users to think it was a normal text file. Opening the attachment activates the Visual Basic script. First, the worm infects damage on the local machine, overwriting random files including office files and image files. However, it hides mp3 files instead of deleting them. Then it copies itself to all addresses in the Windows address book used by Microsoft Outlook, allowing it to spread much faster than any other previous email worm. The worm originated in the Philippines on May 4th, 2000. Thereafter, following daybreak westward across the world as employees began their workday that Friday morning, moving first to Hong Kong, then to Europe, and finally to the United States. The outbreak was later estimated to have caused 5.5 to 8.7 billion damages worldwide. Within 10 days, over 50 million infections had been reported, and it's estimated that 10% of internet-connected computers in the world were affected at that time. To protect themselves, the Pentagon, the CIA, and the British Parliament, and most large corporations decided to completely shut down their mail system. At the time, it was one of the world's most destructive computer-related disasters ever. De Guzman, who was poor and struggling to pay for internet access at all, created the computer virus intending to steal other people's passwords, which he could then use to log in to their internet access accounts without needing to pay for the service. He justified his actions on his belief that the internet is a human right and that he was not actually stealing. If you thought BrainFuck was bad, JSFuck is sure to make your head spin. It might be the worst programming language ever created. While the language is still widely unknown, JSFuck was derived from BrainFuck and that there are only six characters one can type. Unlike its predecessor, however, JSFuck doesn't require its own compiler or interpreter as it's a valid JavaScript code, meaning that programs can be run in any web browser or engine that interprets JavaScript. It was made to highlight just how weak of a programming language that JavaScript really is, being able to be boiled down to just six characters that allow the evaluation of any expression of any type. This is an account of a Microsoft employee describing a glitch in Microsoft's email system known as Bedlam 3. I was working for Microsoft, and Exchange 5.0 had just been rolled out internally. Employees were getting familiar with the new features. I was writing training courses about the Exchange at the time, so I was also diving in and learning all the ins and outs of Exchange Server and Outlook. On the morning of October 14th, 1997, a Microsoft employee looked at their entry in the company global address list. They noticed that in addition to distribution lists for their team, their department and some social email lists, they were on a distribution list called Bedlam DL3. The employee was just as mystified to the purpose of Bedlam DL3, or Bedlam 3, as it became known internally, as you would be. It's a catchy name though, don't you think? It sparked the curiosity of this particular employee. They decided that they were not comfortable being in someone else's distribution list, and they made a fatal mistake. If you have a question about a distribution list, the best thing to do is look up the owner and email that person or ask. Or you could just email your IT rep and ask her. But the absolute worst possible action is to email the distribution list. And that's the course of action that this employee chose. To Bedlam DL3. 
from blank. Subject, why am I on this mailing list? Please remove me from it. That doesn't sound so bad, does it? It wasn't just bad. It was awful. Everyone on Bedlam 3 got a copy of the please remove me email. And some hit reply all. Yeah, take me off too. And that message went to everyone. And soon others were joining in. Me too. This is what's known as a reply all storm. Of course, the easiest way for it to stop is if everyone will stop replying to the threat. So several people started saying that. Stop using reply all. You're just making it worse. And of course, these messages also went to everyone. I've seen reply all storms that filled your mailbox with dozens of reply all messages. Bedlam 3 quickly outstripped all of those. It generated a storm of epic proportions. You see, Bedlam DL3 was one of the four Bedlam distribution units. Each Bedlam DL included the names of one quarter of all Microsoft employees. The Bedlam DLs were never intended to be used for email. They were set up by the IT department to map employees to the Windows Server security groups. And as general catch-all groups, Bedlam 3 had 13,000 names on. The storm quickly flooded the network and completely shut down all mail servers. Before it was done, it was estimated that 15 million emails were generated in the space of about an hour. The storm pushed 195 gigabytes of data around the network during that hour. Most of it was messages saying me too and stop using reply all. And I wasn't one of the 13,000 people on Bedlam 3, so I didn't see my mailbox fill up with reply all messages. But since I had to use the same email servers as everyone else, none of my mail was being routed either. It took two whole days for Microsoft to clean up this mess. And of course, being Microsoft, they had t-shirts made. The front saying, I survived Bedlam 3, and the back said, me too. In January and February of 2004, people all around the globe started getting mysterious email messages that just said, I'm just doing my job, nothing personal. Sorry. Each email came with an attachment, and each time people checked their inboxes, they got another copy. The culprit was MyDoom. MyDoom was a very effective worm made to create zombies out of hundreds of thousands of computers. Hackers could then use each hijacked terminal to wage a DOS attack towards a company they identified. In 2004, no one knew who developed the code. Some felt that the MyDoom worm looked very similar to other worms developed in Russian labs. But suspicion isn't proof, and in the end, no one really knew who created this code or why they did so. But the experts agreed that MyDoom was dangerous. Reporters said the code was fast. No other virus had spread so quickly. Effective. MyDoom infected more than 500,000 machines in just one week. Expensive. Damage estimates reached 38.5 billion or more. The virus took over host computers and most cleanup reporting focused on what people needed to do to eliminate the code. But two companies were the real victims. The first version of the worm used infected computers to bombard SEO group with homepage requests. The company couldn't handle that kind of traffic and the site crashed. After an hour of constant attack, the company changed the website address altogether. The second version of the worm did two things. It ordered infected computers to bombard Microsoft's website. It also made it so computers couldn't access 65 antivirus websites. In essence, the worm kept people from cleaning up their own computers. Before hackers released MyDoom, experts knew that an attack like this was theoretically possible. Possible, but they had no idea what it would look like, how it would work, or how users could clean up their computers. They would soon learn all these things in the next coming months. If you made it to the end of this video, thanks for watching. I should mention that while I made this iceberg myself, I took heavy inspiration from Black Omori who made this iceberg. If you know of any other interesting tech stories like the ones I've covered above, feel free to leave a comment and I might make a video covering your topic. And lastly, I want to leave you with some more fun facts. Computers are just flattened out sand with lightning inside. CPUs are rocks we tricked into thinking. And people who like this video are objectively the coolest.